Hi guys, it is turning out to be a beautiful Sunday morning here in the collapse of civilization and the planet and whatnot uh, here on this beautiful last Sunday of 2019, the final Sunday morning of the 20 teens, I guess they're called. And uh, that would make it Sunday, December, where are we? 29th. Good Lord, the clock is ticking towards 2020. Uh, so being Sunday morning, this will be, uh, you know, I love Sunday morning because I get to wear both hats here in the Doomosphere here on YouTube. Uh, so it was a hard decision on how to play my final Doomsday Sermon. For this beautiful Sunday morning, which also uh, will serve as my Monday morning, December 30th, chronicle of the collapse. Uh, and this certainly straddles the fence of Doomsday Sermon and Chronicle of the Collapse. You know, I was going to do one of these roundups of the past 10 years, but guys, I've, I've had about enough of the 20 teens, so uh, I am looking forward, is that the right term, looking forward to the 2020s, which will kick off in three days, and uh, once again, I want to thank my lieutenant, my alert lieutenant, <coughs> Aaron, from Florida, I will be seeing you in a couple of weeks, Aaron. Look forward to that. Uh, <clears throat> but Aaron gets the vote of uh, coming up with this week's Doomsday Sermon and Monday Chronicle of the Collapse. This is from a fellow who I had never heard of until uh, Aaron sent me this yesterday. A fellow, he's a writer from Australia named James, I guess it's pronounced Plested, P-L-E-S-T-E-D. Now I've looked up James and, and he is a major socialist. He uh, believes uh, incorrectly that replacing capitalism with socialism is going to save the planet. And so uh, I, I just, I, as I've stated many times, particularly on Collapse Chronicles, that just because I choose to read somebody's essay does not mean that I endorse everything they're saying. But, uh, so why I might not agree with every bit of what James has to say here, and I do not agree uh, that socialism uh, will do anything to save the planet. Uh, I do think James has a lot to tell us about the future we are heading into <clears throat> starting on Wednesday. Well, it started uh, probably a hundred years ago. So this is James, this is from an outfit called The Bullet. It's one of these socialist, socialist websites called The Bullet. Take it away, James Plested, <clears throat> and tell us how the rich plan to rule a burning planet. I am going to put the link to this long involved essay. I highly advise you read this because this could be a 45 minute uh, video, but if you would just want to sit around and listen to me read it for you, I will be glad to do that. Take it away, James, and tell us how the rich plan to rule a burning planet. The climate crisis is not a future we must fight to avoid. It's an already unfolding reality. It is the intensification of extreme weather, cyclones, storms and floods, droughts and deadly heat waves. 
It is burning forest in Australia, the Amazon, Indonesia, Siberia, Canada, and California. It is melting ice caps, receding glaciers, and rising seas. It's ecosystem devastation and crop failures. It's the scarcity of resources spreading hunger and thirst. It's lives and communities destroyed and millions forced to flee. This crisis is escalating at a terrifying rate. Every year new temperature records are set. Every day new disasters are reported. Here in Australia we are living through a summer of dust and fire. Hot winds from the desert are covering towns and cities. Hundreds uh, from the desert are sweeping up dirt from the parched landscape and covering towns and cities hundreds and thousands of kilometers away. Creeks and riverbeds are being baked dry. Our cities are shrouded in smoke from fires burning for weeks on end, while on the hottest and windiest days the flames grow, devouring everything in their path. Do our rulers, the political leaders and corporate elites who, behind the facade of democracy, make all the important decisions about what happens in our society, understand the danger we face? On the surface, they appear unconcerned. In September, after millions of school students participated in the global climate strike, Greta Thunberg gave her How Dare You speech at the United Nations. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison responded by cautioning <clears throat> against raising the anxieties of children. And then in November, when hundreds of homes were destroyed and people killed by bushfires in New South Wales and Queensland, Morrison told the ABC there was, quote, no evidence that Australia's emissions had any role in that and we are doing our bit to tackle climate change. Mm -hmm. Is Morrison stupid? Somewhere along the line, it appears his words have become unmoored from reality and are now simply free-floating signifiers spinning out of control in a void of unreason. As the empirical evidence of the devastation being caused by climate change in Australia and around the world mounts, so too does the gulf between this reality and the rhetoric of conservative coal fondlers like Morrison grow into a seemingly unbridgeable chasm. But something is wrong with this picture. To believe that someone in Morrison's position, and, and of course guys, you know, he's in Australia writing for an Australian audience, obviously. If he was writing this in the U.S., he would be talking about, he would be saying Donald Trump. If he was writing this in Brazil, he would be saying Bozo Nero. If he was writing this in India, if he was writing this in China, if he was writing this in Russia, you know what I'm saying. You, you can put whatever name you want to, but uh, since he is an Australian writing for an Australian, Australian audience, this is why he continues to refer to his own Prime Minister. <coughs> to believe that someone in Morris's position could genuinely be ignorant of the dangers of climate change is itself to give up on reason. The Prime Minister of Australia is among the most well-briefed people on the planet 
with thousands of staff at his beck and call to update him on the latest developments in climate science or any other field he may wish to get his head around. The only rational explanation is that Morrison and his like are aware of the dangers posed by climate change but are choosing to act as though they're not. On first appearances, this might seem like a fundamentally irrational standpoint. It would be more accurate, however, to describe it as evil. Morrison is smart enough to see that any genuine effort to tackle the climate crisis and again, uh, what I'm going to add to the climate crisis is the other eight uh, planetary boundaries. Uh, you, you know, I'm getting a little tired of just all of the focus being on one of the planetary boundaries. But anyway, this is uh, not my sermon. This is James's sermon. Anyway. Okay, uh, Morrison is smart enough to see that any genuine effort to tackle the climate crisis would involve a challenge to the system of free market capitalism that he has made his life's mission to serve, and he has chosen to defend the system. Morrison and others among the global political and business elite have made a choice to build a future in which capitalism survives even if it brings destruction on an unimaginable scale. They are like angels of death happy to watch the world burn and millions burn with it if they can preserve for themselves the heavenly realm of a system that has brought them untold riches. This is language that Morrison, an evangelical Christian, should understand. What might be harder for him to grasp is that he is on the wrong side. When seen from this perspective, everything becomes clearer. In the face of the climate crisis, the main priority of the global ruling class and its political servants is to batten down the hatches publicly they are telling school kids not to worry about the future. Behind the scenes, however, in the cabinet offices, boardrooms, mansions, and military high commands, they are hard at work planning for a future in which they can maintain their power and privilege amid the chaos and destruction of the burning world around them. We are not, as some in the environmental movement argue, quote, all in this together. There are many ways in which the wealthy minority at the top of society are already protected from the worst climate change impacts. Big corporations can afford to spend millions on mitigating climate change risks, ensuring their assets are protected so they can keep their businesses running even during a major disaster. Businesses and wealthy individuals can also protect themselves by taking out insurance policies that will pay out if their property is damaged in a flood, fire, or other climate-related disaster. The rich 
are also protected from climate change on a more day-to-day -day level, they tend to live in the leafiest suburbs in large climate-controlled houses. They have shorter commutes to work, where again, they're most often to be found in the most comfortable air-conditioned buildings. They're not the ones working on farms or construction sites and factories or warehouses, struggling with the increasing frequency of summer heat waves. They're not the ones living in houses with no air conditioning, sweating their way through stifling summer nights. They have swimming pools and manicured lawns and can afford their own large water tanks to keep their gardens green in the hot, dry summer months. What about in the most extreme scenarios where what we might call the natural defenses enjoyed by the wealthy are bound to fail? What happens when the firestorms bear down on their country retreats or rising seas threaten their beach houses. Money, it turns out, goes a long way. In November 2018, for instance, when large areas of California were engulfed in flames and more than 100 people burned to death, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian hired their own private firefighting crew to save their $50 million Calabasas mansion. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005, the city's wealthiest residents evacuated well in advance and hired a private army of security guards from companies such as Blackwater to protect their homes and possessions from the mass of poor, mainly black, residents were left behind. In the event of disaster, the response, the rich, has not been out... The Okay, there must be a word missing. In the event of disaster, the response of the rich hasn't been to work, oh, I see, with others to ensure the collective security of all of those affected. It has been to use all of the resources at their disposal to protect themselves and their property. And increasingly, as in New Orleans, this protection has come in the form of armed violence directed at those less well-off, people whose desperation they fear could turn them into a threat. The most forward-thinking of the super-rich are aware that we are heading toward a future of ecological and social breakdown, and they are keen to keep ahead of the curve by investing today in things they will need to survive. Writing in The Guardian in 2018, media theorist and futurist Douglas Rushkoff related his experience of being paid half his annual salary to speak at what he called, quote, a super deluxe private resort on the subject on the future of technology. He was expecting a room full of investment bankers. When he arrived there, however, he was introduced to, quote, five super wealthy guys from the upper echelon, echelon of the hedge fund world. Um, then he quotes at length, I, I remember uh, reading this Guardian article, it might have been a doomsday sermon. Oh well, let me go, this is a lengthy quote, what the hell, let me go ahead and, and quote it. 
quoting uh, this Guardian article. I need to get this guy on the show. Quote, After a bit of small talk, I realized they had no interest in the information I had prepared about the future of technology. They had come with questions of their own. Which region will be less affected by the coming climate crisis, New Zealand or Alaska? Finally, the CEO of a brokerage house explained that he had nearly completed building his own underground bunker system and asked, how do I maintain a faratai over my own security force after the event? The event. That was their euphemism for the environmental collapse, social unrest, nuclear explosion, unstoppable virus, or Mr. Robot hack that takes everything down. They knew armed guards will be required to protect their compounds from the angry mobs, but how would they pay their guards once money was worthless? What would stop their guards from, choos from choosing their own leader? The billionaires considered using special combination locks on the food supply that only they knew, or making guards wear disciplinary collars of some kind in return for survival. Close quote. Anyway, getting back to James's rant. There is a reason these conversations go on, be, go on only behind closed doors. If your plan is to allow the world to spiral toward mass death and destruction while you retreat to a bunker in the South Island of New Zealand or some other isolated area to live out your days in comfort, protected by armed guards whose loyal to, loyalty to you, whose loyalty you maintain by the threat of death, you are unlikely to win much in the way of public support. Better to keep the militarized bunker thing on the lowdown and keep people thinking we are all <coughs> in this together. And if we just install some solar panels, recycle more, ride to work, and so on, we will somehow turn this all around and march arm in arm toward a happy and a sustainable future. The rich don't have to depend only on themselves. Their most powerful and well-armed protector is the capitalist state, which they can rely on to advance their interests even when those interests may conflict with the imperative to preserve some semblance of civilization. This is where people like Morrison or Trump or Bozo Nero or Trudeau or Putin or Modi or Jinnipeg come in. They are the ones who have been delegated the task as Karl Marx put it in the Communist Manifesto of, quote, managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie, close quote. In the context of climate change, this means taking the steps necessary to ensure the continued ability of the capitalist class to profit even if the world may be unraveling into ecological breakdown and social chaos. Okay, now he gets to his evidence. <clears throat> there are three main ways in which Australia and other world powers are working 
towards this. First, they're building their military might, spending billions of dollars on ensuring they have the best means of destruction at their disposal to help pro project their power. Is that project or protect? I would say project and protect their power in an increasingly unstable world. Second, they are building walls. Hmm. They are building walls. That's kind of what I'm doing when I finish this rant. Uh, and brutal detention regimes to make sure borders can be crossed only by those deemed necessary to the requirements of profit-making. Third, they are enhancing their repressive apparatus by passing anti-protest laws and expanding and granting new powers to the police and security agencies to help crush dissent at home. I'm, I'm surprised he didn't mention here the, uh, the growing uh, uh, ability or power or whatever of yanking the internet. Uh, more and more you're seeing uh, keeping, shutting down the internet. Uh, but I'm sure uh, this is somewhere, it's all in the strategy. <clears throat> Military strategists have been awake to the implications of climate change for a long time, as early as 2003 in a report commissioned by the Pentagon. U.S. researchers Peter Schwartz and Doug Randall argued that, quote, violence and disruption stemming from the stresses created by abrupt changes in the climate pose a different type of threat to national security than we are accustomed to today. Military, con this is quoting this Pentagon report from 17 years ago, military confrontations may be triggered by a desperate need for natural resources such as energy, food, and water rather than conflicts over ideology, religion, or national honor. The shifting motivation for confrontation would alter which countries are most vulnerable and the existing warning signs of security threats, close quote. And, and, and don't think that these one percenters uh, do not have that report uh, in, in their little file. More recently, a 2015 U.S. Department of Defense memorandum to Congress argued, quote, climate change is an urgent and growing threat to our national security, contributing to increased natural disasters, refugee flows, and conflicts over basic resources such as food and water. These impacts are already occurring, and the scope, scale, and intensity of these impacts are projected to increase over time." Close quote. That was 2015. The Australian military has also been preparing for an increasingly unstable and unstable geopolitical environment driven in part by the impact of climate change. The 2009 Australian Defense White Paper included a section titled New Security Concerns, Climate Change and Resource Scarcity, close quote, which pointed to the vulnerabilities of many countries in our region the paper was explicit in linking these to a possible increase in, quote, threats inimical to our interest, 
close quote, and suggested that military capabilities would need to be strengthened accordingly. A 2018 Senate inquiry into the implications of climate change for national security drew similar conclusions. Although discussions about military preparedness are often pitched in terms of the need for increased development assistance, disaster relief, and so on, the practice of the U.S., Australia, and other military powers over the past few decades leaves little room for doubt as to what their role will be. When they're not invading countries on the other side of the world, killing hundreds of thousands, reducing cities to rubble, and imprisoning and torturing anyone who opposes them to secure access to fossil fuels, they are acting as the enforcers of capitalist interest closer to home. Uh, then he talks, uh, he goes in, and this is a long, long, uh, I did not realize uh, how long this was going to take. So he talks more about the response to Hurricane Katrina, uh, then the response in Australia to some similar disaster. Uh, okay. The idea that the military could be a force for good in the context of environmental catastrophe and social breakdown is laughable. I'm sorry, I can't remember who was it that I interviewed this summer uh, talking about how we were going to convince the military to uh, be a force of good. Yes, uh, the idea is laughable. Whatever the rhetoric, the role of the military is to secure the interest of a nation's capitalist class amid the competitive global scramble for resources and markets. Uh, he, then he gives a a long quote from Thomas Friedman, which I'm going to skip over. Uh, the military are gangsters for capitalism, and in the future, they are likely to double down on savagery. Uh, yes, James, that is exactly what they are going to do. Double down on savagery to protect the system with a capital S. Okay, uh, and then the next way in which the world's most powerful capitalist states are preparing for climate catastrophe is by massively increasing what is euphemistically called border security. Uh, so uh, you know, talking about while while cheering on the uh, the uh, knocking down the Berlin Wall in the decades since, European countries have built around one thousand kilometers of new border walls in uh, and fences. Most of those have been constructed since 2015. Uh, a 2018 report by the World Bank titled Groundswell Preparing for Internal Climate Migration found that just three regions, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia, could generate 143 million climate migrants by 2050. Yep, 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 yep. And again, guys, I have got to skip ahead 
Um, so far, the measures discussed here have been those primarily directed outward by states seeking to defend the interests of their capitalist class in the international sphere. This is in part designed to create an us and them mentality. Uh, he talks about that. Anyway, guys, this just goes on and on and on and on. Uh, okay, let's just get... I'm sorry, you will have to go on the link and read. I'm about two-thirds of the way through this excellent essay. I obviously need to bring this man on the show in 20... 20. Uh, let's get down to the uh, bottom. If you imagine this picture as the world and the Goldman Sachs building as the gilded realm inhabited by the world's super rich and the political class that serve them all you would need to add is some heavily armed guards around your building and you'd get a pretty good sense of what lies ahead. Our rulers' apparent lack of concern about climate change is a ruse. They hope that if they can just head off dissent for long enough they will succeed in building this future brick by brutal brick and there will be nothing the rest of us can do about it. We need to fight for something different, a system in which our economy is not just a destructive machine grinding up human and natural resources to create mega profits for the rich one in which the pro but instead one in which the productive life of society is managed collectively by those who do all the work and where decisions are made not in the interest of private profit but in the interest of human need we need socialism, and the fight for it is the great challenge of our generation. At stake is nothing less than the world itself. And one more time, I, am, uh, I agree with everything that James uh, had to say in, in this article about capitalism and about the one percenters doing everything they're going to do to cover their own asses. That, uh, that is exactly, uh, I mean, it's why they're flying to Mars. They know damn well. Uh, I, you know, I, I've been on the fence about this issue, whether, uh, wh whether these people, uh, what are they thinking? Since I, I no longer believe that they can be that stupid. Donald Trump could be that stupid. But the rest of these guys, they're not that stupid. Uh, they know damn well what's happening. And I assure you, uh, you know, I, I mean, when I wrap up this video, what I am doing, the chronicler of the collapse of civilization, I, I, am, I am getting back out there and building my little fence between me and Mad Max next door. Me. I, this is what I am doing. This is why that this whole thing about socialism is 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 a is, is, is a joke. Uh, when when the shit hits the fan and the rubber hits the road, everybody is going to be looking out for number one and their families and, and their tribe. 
uh, you, you know, what's the difference between Sam Mitchell, uh, you, you know, building a fence between him and Mad Max next door? I, I don't have to look any farther uh, than my own yard to, to understand uh, the first 99% uh, of what James Plested is, is, is talking about any more than I need to look for uh, evidence, if not proof, that as soon as you start feeling threatened by your next door neighbor, you are going to start putting up border fences to keep them out. This is, this is humans being humans. And uh, with that, I am going to wrap up the final, uh, the, the final uh, Doomsday Sermon of 2019 and the final Monday morning Chronicle of the Collapse of the 2010s. And uh, as we head into 2020, I'm building a damn fence to keep out Mad Max right here in the heart of Texas. Anyway, get out there and enjoy the last two days of the Halcyon 20 teens while you still can because uh, 2020, 2020, is uh, the 2020s will kick off and uh, the rocket ride will begin. I suggest you start building a wall between you and your next door neighbor because uh, things are getting ready to get real ugly on this planet. Bye guys.